morning. I'm the director of the Gonzaga Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Gonzaga tonight. Uh, we have a, a great talk, as you, as you know, um, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the fact that we're on the ancestral lands of the Spokane tribal people, the people of the river, and we wouldn't be here as a university were it not for the people of this area having invited us to come and start a university. So it's always nice to center ourselves and remind ourselves of that fact. The Gonzaga Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment was launched in 2021 uh, with the interest of trying to figure out how Gonzaga can be of greater service to the Inland Northwest in understanding and responding to the challenge of climate change. So we do things like hosting uh, and events like this uh, and these that are coming up in the future. So you can go to our website and register for those if they look like they're of interest. Uh, and we also host uh, other events for K-12 teachers, for example. We do climate literacy workshops. We're also helping address uh, extreme heat in Spokane and in the region, trying to help the community understand and respond to the challenges of a changing climate. Uh, so if you'd like to get involved, I encourage you to go to our website at gonzaga.edu slash climate center and follow us on our mailing list and come to future events. So thank you all for being here this evening. Our speaker uh, this evening is Dr. Stephen Amstrup, who is the senior or chief uh, scientist for Polar Bears International. Before joining Polar Bears International, Dr. Amstrup was a research wildlife biologist with the United States Geological Survey at the Alaska Science Center in Anchorage, Alaska, where he led polar bear research in Alaska for 30 years. He earned a BS in forestry from the University of Washington and MS in wildlife management from the University of Idaho and a PhD in wildlife management for the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. His topic tonight, as you know, is polar bears and global warming, connecting the dots to the rest of us. And it's a great opportunity to learn about not only this beautiful large mammal, but also what it means for all of us and the, and the overall changing context of the world. We'll um, hear his talk now, and then afterwards we'll have an opportunity to engage with the speaker and, and ask some questions. That includes folks at home. Uh, if you're at home and like to ask the speaker a question, one of the ways you could try to do that is by emailing climatecenter at gonzaga.edu, and I will try and look at my phone and uh, pose a question or two if I'm able to, uh, so folks from around the world who are joining us tonight live stream can also uh, participate. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Amstrup. get the other view, the one we had earlier. Let's just play it again. There we go. Okay. Okay, well, thank you, Brian. I really appreciate you inviting me to come down here. I appreciate the introduction, and thank you to everybody who came to uh, hear me flap my jaws for a little while here today. Uh, giving up a very nice summer evening, uh, perhaps one of the few remaining. We'll uh, wait to see how that transpires. Today what I want to do is to talk about polar bears, of course, but talk about how important it is to pay attention to the message that the plight of the polar bear is sending to the rest of us. Global warming is indeed a global phenomenon, and although polar bears have become kind of the poster species, for global warming, the message that they're conveying uh, comes to all of us. So. so before I get started, I want to thank my wife, Virginia, who has steadfastly been by my side for all these years, putting up with a lot that maybe she didn't expect to put up with, uh, being the yin to my yang, and uh, also uh, helping me get dressed. So uh, uh, Brian uh, gave the introduction. I don't think I need to cover much on this slide, uh, but I do want to give special thanks also, in addition to Virginia, to uh, my friend Daniel J. Cox, who's a wildlife photographer who has uh, kindly contributed many of his outstanding photos, and also Dr. Flavio Lehner from Cornell University, who's a climate scientist, who I'm very happy to say we just recently were able to recruit as a part-time employee at Polar Bears International. And uh, he's also a, a good and longtime friend. 
So we'll start out with some polar bear 101. The polar bear is the largest non-aquatic predator on the globe. A large adult male like this one can stand nearly five feet high at the shoulder when standing on all fours. And I can tell you, if they walk up on you when you're out on the ice, they look as big as a house. They can be over 10 feet long, have feet the size of platters, have a 45 or 50 inch neck. They truly are impressive creatures. Uh, but like all members of the bear family, they start out in life small and vulnerable. Now, I spent 30 years studying polar bears, and the technique that we used was called capture and recapture, and that meant going out every year, capturing as many bears as we can, marking them, and then going out and doing it again the next year. And the starting event of all of that is shooting a polar bear from a helicopter with a dart gun. And so I'm going to show you a little video of that. But you go out on the ice with a helicopter, you look for footprints, you follow the footprints till they lead you to a bear, and then you get ready to shoot the bear. So watch very carefully here. We're going to shoot this bear in the neck with a dart. Boom, right there. Want to watch that again? I like watching it. And we prefer to shoot them in the neck or the shoulder because that's where uh, they have the least subcutaneous body fat. And the drug that we used is very lipophilic, which means it'll attach to fat cells and then is released more slowly into the body. We don't always get the right injection, but that's what we would strive for. Sometimes they take more than one injection, but eventually they have trouble standing straight up, can't walk a straight line, and uh, eventually go to sleep, usually within three to five minutes, uh, sometimes longer. But when uh, they are safely asleep, then we can begin our work, which means taking a whole variety of measurements. It usually takes us about an hour to process every bear that we catch, um, taking skull length and width, total length, heart girth, uh, measuring uh, the weight, the total weight of the animal, and putting in a number-coded ear tag into the ear so we can identify the individual and tattooing the lip of the bear. So in case they lose the uh, ear tag, we still have a number associated with that animal. So if we recapture it in a subsequent year, we know who it is and therefore we can uh, uh, process the information about how it's doing compared to the last time. We take uh, small samples of uh, subcutaneous fat, uh, blood samples, hair samples, a whole variety of uh, information that we've been able to derive over the years from that and selected individuals, uh, uh, adult females only, because males have necks that are bigger than their heads. Uh, so if you put a radio collar on, they would be like putting a collar on a traffic cone. Uh, but uh, on adult females, we found out how we could safely put radio collars on, and that became one of the most important tools that has now been used uh, all around the world. I was the first person to uh, successfully radio collar polar bears back in 1981. My early work using radio telemetry showed that not only are polar bears the largest of all the non-aquatic predators, but they're the most mobile. Uh, some individuals had activity areas exceeding 600,000 square kilometers, or an area about the size of uh, California and Oregon combined. If you uh, want to get an example of uh, one of the movements of the bears, this is one from the late 90s that we followed around by radio telemetry, and this was in early years when we weren't getting as high a frequency of radio locations as we do nowadays. <clears throat> but you can still get the idea of the area that this animal covered and compare that to this area that I've circled in green, which encompasses the whole migration of the porcupine caribou herd, which many people think of as this really tremendous animal movement, and it is. But by comparison to what many polar bears do, it's uh, pretty minimal. Another early discovery was I kind of solved a mystery in Alaska. When I first went up there in 1980, the Russians and the Canadians were both claiming that the polar bears in Alaska were really just visitors, seasonal visitors, that they actually were born either in Alaska or either in Russia or Canada because very few maternal dens had ever been found in Alaska. Most polar bears worldwide den in uh, structures like this that are adjacent to the shore or not very far inland 
uh, where snow banks build up against uh, uh, topographic relief. But what I found by radio telemetry was that in uh, Alaska, at least historically, over 65% of the bears were denning out on the drifting pack ice. This is really an interesting phenomenon because a female bear goes into a den in the fall and continues to drift with the ice, sometimes 900 kilometers or more, and then emerging in the spring with the newborn cubs and somehow figuring out how to make their way home. Uh, this was a, a really interesting discovery and also kind of an interesting phenomenon to me because although 900 kilometers isn't very big from the standpoint of, say, migratory birds, but at least when birds are migrating, they have their eyes open and they can see where they're going. Polar bears are doing this migration in the blind. The most important finding from my work and all of the work of other scientists around the country, or around the world that are studying polar bears is that they need ice. And I'm sure everybody in this room has heard about the melting sea ice and the impact on polar bears, but what does that really mean? <clears throat> polar bears use the sea ice for essentially all of their life history needs, and the most important of those is feeding. They feed principally on uh, two species of seals, ringed and bearded seals. The ring seal is a relatively small seal. It's called a ring seal because of the ring-like pattern in its fur, and I think you can guess why these are called bearded seals. These guys can weigh six or 800 pounds as adults. Polar bears catch seals by waiting for them, and you've probably seen the classic case of either a polar bear or a native Alaskan hunter waiting by a breathing hole for a seal to come up. Seals are air-breathing mammals. They spend much of their time in a frozen ocean environment, and they maintain breathing holes in the ice surface with large claws on their foreflippers. Uh, but it must be kind of a terrifying lifestyle if you're a seal to know that you have to come up to breathe, and there could be a polar bear waiting for you. <laughs> polar bears also have learned about the uh, uh, breeding habits of ring seals. Ring seals in the spring of the year create these little caves. They're below the surface of the snow and above the surface of the ice. They come up through their breathing holes, open up these little caves, and it's, where, it's here where they give birth to their white-coated pups. This is uh, my wife, Virginia, uh, with a, an abandoned pup that we found on one year when she was able to come out with me on the, on the sea ice on one of our expeditions. Polar bears have become very adept at finding these structures and removing their occupants. Another way that uh, polar bears catch seals is by sneaking up on them when they're hauled out on the surface of the ice in the spring. Now, uh, seals molt like most mammals do, but they also have a countercurrent blood flow system that shunts blood away from their skin when they're in the cold water. And you have to remember that for most of the year, the water that they're swimming around in is actually below freezing. So it's very cold, and in order to protect the temperature of their core, they shunt blood away from their surface, but that prevents them from being able to molt. They need blood going to the skin in order to molt their fur, so they haul out in the spring and early summer, and uh, the sun warms up their skin, and they're able to shed their, their fur and grow another coat, but when they're laying out there, they're kind of vulnerable to polar bear predation, and uh, so they don't typically go very far from their breathing hole. Now, I've never seen a polar bear actually catch a seal hauled out like this, but I was in Svalbard a few years ago and sat on an airplane next to a coal miner who worked in a small coal mine up in uh, the uh, uh, Svalbard archipelago. And he and a buddy were out with snow machines, and they happened upon this scene. So they were just out recreating one day when they weren't working. This is the mountains of Svalbard in the background, and this is this large expanse of landfast ice, very flat ice. So it's not really ideal ice for a polar bear to hunt from. But they paused and they saw a seal basking in the sun and a polar bear sneaking up on it. Pretty impressive, and to think that he captured that film with an iPhone. <laughs> you know, I've been up there for 30 years, I've never been able to see that event, and he takes a picture of it with an iPhone. 
So polar bears depend on the sea ice to catch their prey. They can only reliably catch seals from the surface of the ice in those ways that I described. But the ice is also the source of the nutrients that enter the polar bear's body. The underside of sea ice is uh, like a miniature mountain range. It's got mountain, it's got peaks and valleys and crevices, and there's algae, diatoms, uh, small shrimp-like creatures, fish that live in that environment. And uh, the ring seals, of course, feed on uh, the creatures that are down there providing the, uh, uh, the rest of the food chain, and polar bears eat the seals. And a recent study showed that uh, looking at a broad swath of the Arctic, 86% of the carbon that's in a polar bear's body actually comes from that under sea ice or epontic community. So polar bears depend on the surface of the ice not just as a surface to catch their prey or to walk around on, but as their source of uh, nutrients. So polar bears depend on the ice, but as you've all heard, the sea ice is going down. Over the course of the last uh, several decades, beginning in 1979 with the advent of the satellite era, we've seen about a 13% per decade decline in the uh, summertime sea ice. That's equivalent loss of about 13 times the size of the state of Washington. We often have people uh, call up or write into Polar Bears International and say, well, we, you know, we could make big slabs of styrofoam for the polar bears to walk around on and replace that melting ice. Of course, that doesn't replace the ecosystem that's supporting the bear, um, but also 13 times the size of the state of Washington is a hell of a lot of styrofoam. So not very practical. But anyway, uh, we're losing the ice, and importantly, most of the ice that's, uh, the ice is disappearing most rapidly is the ice that's adjacent to shore. And this uh, uh, graph shows uh, the first four years, the September sea ice extent during the first four years that I was working on polar bears in Alaska, and the last four years. In those early years, I could go to the shoreline in Barrow or Prudhoe Bay and look uh, offshore and see the sea ice. It was either right against the shore or very, very close. But in the latter years, the ice is hundreds of miles offshore. And it's farther offshore now than it was uh, in 2010 when I uh, left the research environment up there. And this is important because the ice over shallow water near shore is the most productive areas. The water underneath has all of the productivity in the Arctic. And uh, this slide shows these gold dots are historic radio telemetry locations that I collected between 1985 and 1995 when those areas were covered by sea ice. And you can see now the ice isn't even there anymore. So for, from a polar bear standpoint, trying to go out and make a living, there's no there there. Across their range, we know that there's very little for polar bears to eat on land. And a colleague of mine uh, working in, oh, yeah, back up a little bit. We know that polar bears, while they are trapped on land, typically lose almost a kilogram of body weight per day while they're fasting. They can fast a long time if they begin that fast very heavy, but uh, they're still losing weight at a, uh, a phenomenal rate, and there's a limit to what they can do. And recently, uh, my colleague John Whiteman from the University of uh, Wyoming and now at Old Dominion uh, found out that the bears out here also are not feeding. So when the ice leaves that shallow uh, water area that's so productive and they're forced either onto shore or out into the deep polar basin water, in both cases they're largely food deprived. <clears throat> in 2010, my colleagues and I published a paper in Nature projecting that by the uh, middle of this century, we could lose two-thirds of the world's polar bears if we continued on our current greenhouse gas emissions path. We also, however, showed that there was a linear relationship, there is a linear but inverse relationship between sea ice extent and global mean temperature. So that means the relationship between temperature and sea ice is linear, there's not an abrupt uh, platform or an, an abrupt threshold that we could expect, a tipping point that we could expect in that relationship. So that means if we stop the temperature rise, we can preserve the sea ice and uh, keep polar bears around. 
And uh, we, uh, one of my colleagues, co-author on the paper, uh, did some modeling and showed that indeed, if we halted the growth and green, the increase in uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at any particular time, this slide shows stopping in 2020, we see a little bit of a latent effect that sea ice does continue to decline, but then it's stabilized again instead of going down to essentially zero. So we know that we can save polar bears if we stabilize temperature. In uh, 2020, my colleagues and I published a follow-up paper to the 2010 paper uh, showing the mechanistic underpinnings of those projections that we made earlier and showing that indeed they still hold true and also showing the areas of the Arctic that are most vulnerable, the places where polar bears are going to disappear first. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but there's 19 subpopulations of polar bears around the Arctic. Here's Alaska, North Pole is about right here. Here's the Russian Arctic, uh, Norway, Finland, um, you know, the Scandinavian countries here. And uh, the colors in this map represent the likelihood of reproductive failure. The darker the color, the greater the likelihood. So where we are now, uh, there's three subpopulations that are actually already documented to be in uh, uh, reproductive, at least partial reproductive failure. By 2040, a lot more dark, 2060, 2080. By the end of the century, there's very few places left that polar bears might still be able to persist. So the available evidence suggests that uh, if we don't halt global warming, uh, polar bears will disappear. But what I want to talk about now is what does that really mean to the rest of us? Is, uh, is the message that the polar bears are sending us really an important one for us to heed? So before I do that, though, I want to talk about why we have global warming. How does it work? Uh, I was giving a talk several years ago, and this woman at the end of my talk kept asking me these questions, and I couldn't wrap my mind around what she was asking me until I realized she was thinking that global warming was caused by the heat that escapes from our houses if they're not well enough insulated. And of course, that's not what it is, but I thought, you know, a little tutorial on global warming uh, can't hurt anybody. So in an environment where greenhouse gas concentrations are stable, which is most of the last million years, uh, what we have is uh, shortwave radiation coming in to Earth from the sun. And that radiation warms up the surface, it warms up our bodies, it warms up the trees, everything else. And then it starts to escape back out into space in the form of long wave radiation. The short wave radiation coming in passes through the atmosphere without interference, but greenhouse gases in the atmosphere delay the transfer of that energy back up into space. And it's actually the delay of that energy back up into space that makes life on Earth possible. Ultimately, though, the same amount of energy, when greenhouse gas concentrations are stable, the same amount of energy is going up as is coming down. Now, when greenhouse gas concentrations are constantly increasing, we're out of energy balance. The same amount of energy is coming in, but with more higher concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we get a longer delay in that uh, uh, period that before the, the uh, energy actually escapes back into space. And with the, uh, with the uh, gas concentrations constantly increasing, we have less energy getting out than is coming in. So the Earth is out of energy balance with space, and that's what's causing the problem. If you wanted to think about that in a graphical sense, this isn't, by the way, there's no data here, this is just a drawing, but Think of a graph, temperature on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. If greenhouse gas concentrations are stable, you can think of the average temperature over time as being essentially a horizontal line. Now, of course, there's lots of humps and bumps in that because we know some years are warmer, some years are cooler. Due to the natural chaos of the climate system, there's a lot of uh, individual variation among years and among seasons. But the average of all of those is uh, a flat line. When greenhouse gas concentrations are increasing, we have all that same natural variation, but now it's increasing over a uh, rising baseline. 
So we know that there's still that natural year-to-year -year uncertainty, but we also have the certainty that if greenhouse gas concentrations are increasing, the Earth has to warm. And another thing I want to point out about this is climate scientists have for decades been telling us, well, every global warming doesn't mean that every year is going to be warmer than the previous. There's, there is that natural chaos in the system, but the frequency of warmer years than uh, cooler years is going to be greater. And uh, uh, Jerry Meal from National Center of Atmospheric Research a few years ago did a, uh, an examination of the, of the uh, observational data. And at that time, this was probably 10 years ago, uh, we were experiencing twice as many record hot spells as record cold spells. This year, it's been 10 to 1. And we're going that direction every year. Also, scientists have been telling us that the peaks and the troughs here are going to get steeper, going to get, the troughs are going to get deeper and the peaks are going to get higher. So not only going to have that same kind of variation, but it's going to be more extreme and in fact that's what we've been experiencing in recent years. So how warm will it get? Well that's really up to us and climate scientists talk about scenarios of warming uh, or storylines, if you will. So if society does this, how warm is it likely to get by the centuries and, and beyond? Uh, if we do this, is how much is that going to change? And uh, we've uh, historically been on a track of pretty high temperature by the end of the century, and uh, that's often referred to as business as usual. In the most recent uh, IPCC reports, they actually divided what had been one sort of high temperature curve into two. But basically, we're talking about uh, continuing to rely heavily on fossil fuels uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, there are many now who feel like with uh, recent efforts in uh, uh, converting to renewable energy and things like that, uh, that we're probably more on a path of uh, two and a half to three and a half degrees of warming by the end of the century. And of course, you're probably all familiar with the Paris Agreement of 2015 which really said, you know, if we want to avoid disaster, we should try and hold temperatures below, temperature rise below two degrees C, uh, and preferably one and a half degrees C. So those are kind of the, the boundaries that scientists talk about when they're doing, uh, when they're doing their projections. Um, I have some questions about whether or not this is really our likely path, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, for one thing, it's based on unfulfilled promises. So uh, all of the nations that signed the Paris Agreement and actually those that participated going back to the Kyoto Agreements uh, have been promising to limit their emissions of certain greenhouse gases. But for most of those countries, the promises haven't been codified and there's really no enforcement. So we're saying, well, yeah, these, these countries, we're gonna do this, but you know, it's not really happening yet. And in fact, none of the major emitters has codified their uh, uh, emission promises um, into law. Uh, and then there's also the possibility of uh, changes in administration that might change the direction that we take. And during the Trump administration, we were on a path pushing as hard as we could to stay on the highest emission levels possible. And there was a whole variety of things pulling us out of uh, uh, the uh, Paris Agreement, uh, doing away with regulations on methane leaks and things like that. And more recently, uh, even on our uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which is the first major U.S. action on uh, trying to uh, halt global warming, we had to have a compromise in there that allowed for more drilling or to hasten uh, drilling permits in uh, uh, offshore waters. So there's a lot of things that, uh, that uh, we can see in those storylines that climate scientists are looking at that, you know, maybe we can't count too strongly on that three degree message. And also very importantly is as we warm, the earth approaches more and more critical tipping points. That now remember I said that there was no tipping point between temperature and sea ice extent. But there's a lot of tipping points in the ecosystems of the world with regard to temperature. 
And among those are, you've probably seen the news about uh, uh, the dieback of the Amazon forest due to burning and a whole bunch of other activities. And the fact that scientists now think we're within a decade or maybe two decades of uh, the Amazon moving from being a carbon sink to a carbon source. That would be a major tipping point. Uh, boreal forest fires, as the Arctic warms, not only do uh, the soils emit more carbon and more methane, uh, that also then contribute to uh, global warming. Uh, but forest fires are becoming more and more common up there and ultimately could be a real contributor. Um, and I'd like to uh, add that we can't really ignore the observations that we have thus far. So this is the full record of the Mauna Loa Observatory and CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And uh, I don't see any major trend of, you know, any major downward trend in the end of that curve. Now, there's ways to explain that away, but this is what we're experiencing. And uh, if you look at, uh, so let me go back. That's CO2 only. If you look at, this is some data I've been looking at recently, total global emissions. This, so this is a CO2 equivalents including all of the greenhouse gases uh, that are adjusted for their uh, global warming potential. And if you look at that range of numbers, the only decline is last year, or 2020, during the pandemic. And we already knew that the economy was really taking a dip then. The uh, uh, not final estimates suggest that our emissions are back up in 2021. And, and this year, although it takes a while for those kind of data to be assembled by the people who are, who are doing that work. So it, it's not clear to me that we're on that three and a half degree path, and it's important to realize that we could get back onto uh, a business as usual path, or maybe we still really are on that. We have some choices, and our choices have consequences. Flavio Lehner, the climate scientist at Cornell that I mentioned earlier, did a really great paper in 2016 looking at summer, future summer temperatures around the world. And one of the things that he showed is that in a business as usual situation, um, if you look at North America, the vast majority of North America has a 90%, every summer has a 90% probability of being warmer than ever any summer we've ever experienced. Now, if we were to get on, oops, if we were to get on the uh, Paris, uh, something close to two degrees, pressing the wrong button, um, we have a much lower, less than 30% of our future summers are likely to be warmer than anything we've ever experienced. I mean, that's still not good, but it's better than that. So uh, we have some choices to make with regard to these storylines. Now, if we focus in on the Spokane area, one of the things that the last couple of summers have had me thinking about is how many hot days are we experiencing in the summertime? And if you go back to 1900, we had very, very few days where the temperature was above 96 degrees. Very few days where temperatures rose above the mid-90s. A little bit of a, blurp, a blip here in most recent years, but moving forward, if we were to stay on the high emissions pathway uh, by the latter part of this century, we could be seeing 40, 50, 60 days above 96 degrees uh, in the summertime. If we look at the opposite thing, how, many, how much uh, cooling effect will we have at night? One of the things I heard from friends and neighbors this summer was, geez, we can't open our windows and cool the house anymore because it's not getting cold in the, at, at night like it used to. And that's part of uh, having more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But looking at the black here is observations. And uh, what we see is that if you look at the number of days below 53 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, for the first part, the, the biggest part of uh, the 1900s, there was a lot of days when we got down into the mid to low 50s or even cooler. Not so much lately. And if we continue to follow that trend uh, over uh, until the end of the century, we're going to be in uh, deep yogurt as far as being able to cool our, uh, our houses. Uh, we were told when we were building that, oh, you don't have to worry about having air conditioning here uh, because, uh, you know, it's, 
we only have very few hot, really hot days in the summertime, and you can always cool your house down by opening the windows. And uh, you can't cool your house down very well if uh, it's uh, that warm. So what, what do those temperature ranges mean? Uh, this is an unusual graph. I'm going to take a little bit to, ex uh, to explain it to you. So here we have a number of summers out of 30. We're looking at 30-year climatologies. And here we have uh, temperatures. So take a look right here. What this means is that in Spokane, between 1986 and 2015, there were seven summers where the uh, mean temperature was 65 degrees. And uh, so if we look at the future for Spokane, under the high emissions scenario, you, we see that it's all clustered way over here, about 10 degrees warmer. Now, what does that look like? Is there an analog that we can compare it to? And uh, if we look at Los Angeles, Spokane is actually going to be a little bit warmer, more warm days than Los Angeles does now. And if you think about what that means for our forests, for our farming, for our availability of water, uh, for our recreation. I mean, if you've ever been to LA, you know the environment there is way different than it is here. We have an opportunity again, choices and consequences. If we were to hold emissions down, we could preserve a climate in Spokane that at least is reminiscent of the one that we've had. Now, this, of course, isn't just limited to the inland northwest. We can look at other places. Indianapolis uh, in the future is going to look like Dallas does now in terms of its temperature regime. Davis, California is going to look more like Phoenix. Toronto is going to look more like Washington, D.C. So all around the country, we're going to be seeing warmer temperatures. Climates, uh, climate at the latter part of this century, if we don't do something about it, again, we have choices, uh, that's different than anything we've ever experienced. And of course, along with warmer temperatures comes things like wildfires. In the 70s and 80s, we had a fire season of approximately 140 days. We're now up to over 220 days uh, at, well, now, that was published in 2016. Um, but we actually know that under some circumstances, we can have fires all year round. And the Marshall Fire near Boulder, Colorado last year uh, was a real uh, impressive example of uh, wildfire in the middle of the winter. And then uh, the uh, Hermit Peak Fire in New Mexico this year began in early April. So we're extending the length of our wildfire season because we have warmer, drier fuels. And the opposite side of that is with warmer temperatures, we have more moisture in the uh, atmosphere, and that moisture falls as rain, and we can have some really heavy rains. And we're going to have more and more of those sorts of things. And one of the unfortunate things is the places in the world that historically were moist and humid are becoming wetter. And the places that historically were arid are becoming more arid. And so in the West, we're more on that arid side uh, than on this side, but the destruction is pretty clear all around. One of the things that makes the news a lot is how much sea level is going to rise. And it's always been sort of a sort of an issue with me. I have a colleague at USGS, Dan Moose, who years ago mapped the uh, last interglacial coastline of Florida. And that's this blue line here. And during the last interglacial, which was about 125,000 years ago, the temperature, the global mean temperature, was almost exactly what it is right now. Now you might say, oh, well, how come uh, Flor Florida doesn't look like that now? Well, in the natural environment, with the uh, uh, orbit of the Earth around the sun controlling the natural cycles of glaciation and interglacials, uh, this warming took place over millennia. Now we're doing it in decades, and the ice sheets are not responding. They're not able to respond. They're not, they can't melt as fast as uh, uh, we're warming the world. So we're going to see this kind of flooding sometime in the future. We're guaranteed of that. The cl uh, cl uh, climate scientists and uh, ice sheet specialists are struggling with 
when. But what I'm puzzled by is why nobody ever talks about this ultimate effect. We're there. If we hold the temperature of what it is now, uh, 10 million Floridians are going to be flooded. I was uh, giving a talk at a little place called Boca Grande, and it's a, a small exclusive island community, uh, several years ago. And I talked about this very topic, and I thought that these people would be really concerned about this. And it was as if I didn't say anything at all. It was just total denial. They, you know, no discussion, no questions. Uh, they wanted to see some more polar bear pictures. Uh, that was pretty much it. <coughs> and speaking of denial, the year before that, I'd gone to North Carolina and uh, uh, given a series of lectures. And when I arrived there, my host said, oh, by the way, the, the legislature just passed a law that uh, uh, prohibits global warming. And uh, so you can't talk about global warming. And I said, well, that's what I came to talk about, you know. So, and I went ahead and I mentioned global warming and nobody put me in jail. Uh, but subsequently, I was thinking that if in several hundred years, the uh, eastern seaboard looks like this, we're going to think those North Carolinians are pretty smart. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop talking about warming here pretty quick. But, uh, you know, we always hear our politicians suggesting that, oh, well, you know, we, we can't really impact the economy by, you know, we can't do anything. Hello, hello, because it'll impact the economy. <clears throat> and uh, uh, what's, what's this impact? <laughs> So here is uh, data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And this is a histogram of the, and all it is is counts of events that cost at least a billion dollars. Some of them many billions of dollars to deal with. We've got drought, we've got wildfire, we've got severe winter weather, uh, we've got uh, severe summer storms, tropical cyclones. To me, that's a pretty scary pattern. And, uh, you know, that's impacting our tax dollars, that's impacting our ability to make a living. Um, to me, it's something that ought to be getting people's attention. If you look back in history, a primary cause of sudden collapse has been denial. Oh, that's not happening. Oh, we don't need to worry about that. That's not really an important trend. Um, and for decades, many of our policy leaders have been in denial. They won't talk about global warming. They won't uh, agree to do anything about it. And uh, many of them have been standing steadfastly in the way of doing anything about it. We really need to get on the track of lower emissions. Many people are trying. Many of our leaders are trying. But we've got a ways to go. The data are clear. We can hold our temperatures down to levels that would keep our environment at least recognizable. It's going to take some work, and every year we delay, of course, it's more difficult. Um, if we do so, it'll benefit all of us. So what I'm hoping is that by talking to groups like this, getting the word out, that uh, uh, more and more people will be pushing for action, pushing our leaders to actually care about our future, to care about the future of our children and our grandchildren, to care about our recreational and business opportunities. Everyone here can help us move in the right path. And um, I thank you all in advance for whatever efforts you can put in that. And if you want any more information, you can go to polarbearsinternational.org and find out about what we're doing. and. Uh, what you might be able to help with. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. So um, let's give uh, Dr. Amstrup another hand. Thank you so much. So again, um, I'd love to have a conversation. Uh, some folks are uh, at home, and if you have a question, I'll uh, ha try to also take questions via Climate Center at gonzaga.edu. So if you have a question and you're online, uh, feel free to email that, and I'll do my best. So um, I'd like to pose the first question while you're thinking about questions for Dr. Amstrup. And I was thinking about the interglacial periods in the past. So we've had periods of more ice and, and less ice. What did the polar bears do in the last interglacial period if so much of their life was de is dependent upon sea ice and there wasn't 
if we go far enough back. One thing about polar bears is because they spend almost all of their lives on the ice, we have a very poor fossil record. When they die, bones go to the bottom of the ocean and we don't find very much. But we do know that there were polar bears in Svalbard uh, during the last interglacial. And we know that uh, right at the end of the Pleistocene, uh, before the current warming that, that we're in, there were polar bears as far south as the Baltic Sea. And so what we believe from the minimal amount of, of evidence that we have is that during the glacial periods, when there was more sea ice, polar bears came south. And then they went back north. And uh, now they're, you know, they're, during those uh, natural interglacial periods of the past, their distribution was probably something like it is now. Gotcha. All right, so we've got uh, a mic. If you have a question, just raise your hand and would ask you to use the microphone because otherwise people at home can't, can't hear you. So we've got one back there, Carly. Hi. Um, first off, thanks for um, giving us that talk. That was really interesting and very helpful, especially the data that you shared with us. Um, I was wondering, so everyone always says like you need to advocate for your, like policymakers to actually like put into place laws and regulations that will lead to us reducing our emissions, but what are some of those kinds of policies? I guess I'm like people always say like go and advocate for this vague idea, but I was wondering if you could give us a little bit more direction on that. Well, uh, the, the short answer is that we need to do whatever we can to get off of fossil fuels. So how do you do that? Well, my, uh, what I've always advocated is having a fair carbon price. Nobody likes the government to come in and tell you, oh, you have to have triple pane windows or you have to drive this car or you have to live in this way. But if the government did, was able to do, and this of course is a clinker in the US with our current uh, uh, political system, but if the government could establish a price for carbon, the free enterprise system could figure out how to do that. And if we could just get over that initial hump, I think it would be so much easier because uh, we would be using free enterprise to solve the problem. But negotiating and coming up with a carbon price has been a non-starter. Uh, you know, the, uh, I think it was William Nordhaus uh, won the Nobel Prize in economics in 17, I think it was, something like that, for forecasting or for predicting that the best way to solve the climate change problem was uh, a, uh, a fair price on carbon. He won the Nobel Prize, but uh, who, who pays any attention to that, you know? So I, I, don't, have, uh, I don't really have much more uh, uh, to say about that because uh, I, I've written a lot of stuff trying to influence politicians and I don't think that they're paying any attention. Actually, that's how I, I learned about Dr. Amstrup was um, really excellent editorials in the Spokesman Review. Um, so, <laughs> and I noticed that we have the chief polar bear uh, scientist, uh, and so I was like, hey, he's local. We should invite him to come and talk. So um, take a look at his pieces. Other questions? Uh, yeah, Madden up front. I was just wondering, we heard a little bit about your academic journey and everything. How did you end up in polar bear research and what drew you to this field in the first place? Because it's very cool, but it's also obviously very remote and probably kind of, uh, you, you had to make a lot of sacrifices to go live in the Arctic and study polar bears from helicopters and so on. Well, uh, when I was a little kid, for some reason, from about the size of uh, this, uh, I uh, just wanted to go into the woods and study bears. And I just was always uh, enamored of bears. And uh, I managed to actually do my master's work in central Idaho on black bears. And that was my start studying bears. Uh, but uh, uh, to answer your question about polar bears, so I was working for the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, studying pronghorn antelope in Wyoming. And uh, the director of the Denver Center, which at that time was in charge of research programs in Alaska, said, hey, 
we can't get our polar bear project off the ground. Would you like to go up and, and uh, get it going? And I said, pick me, pick me. But I mean, what could, be, what could be more exciting than giant white bears roaming around in an environment that looks like the moon? And, and I, I, uh, I also should emphasize that I feel in many ways very fortunate to have come into the polar bear world at the time that I did because my early studies were all about documenting healthy polar bear populations that were recovering from over-harvesting that had occurred in the 60s and 70s. And so I saw that and it was, uh, you know, in those days every talk was fun because everything was great. You know, we had lots of big bears, lots of cubs, survival was good. Uh, and then we saw it turning. And so the opportunity for me to see, to go from what was essentially prime polar bear conditions to not so good uh, was really a learning opportunity and gave me some wisdom, I guess, to deal with uh, what we're facing now. We have a question from online, um, and they had a little bit of video issues at the beginning, so they were wondering if they, there might have been a slide early on about whether or not the overall population of polar bears is increasing, stable, or decreasing. I don't know if you had a slide on the population trends uh, at the beginning or not. No, I, I, I did not have uh, uh, any slides about the population trend, but uh, we know that some populations, I think it's three, are definitely declining. We know that, or we think that some others probably are, but uh, uh, we don't have enough data. There's still data uh, availability issues for a lot of them. And we know that a lot of them are just listed as uh, uh, data insufficient to note a trend. There's an issue, though, with trying to think of uh, polar bears globally, because we have estimates for, oh, four populations, I guess, that are really good solid estimates. The one I worked in in Alaska, the two in Hudson Bay, uh, Svalbard area, we've got pretty good estimates. And then the others, we don't really know how many bears are there or what their trend is. We have some ideas of what their trend might be, but it's pretty rough. And so scientists have come up, because people always ask, well, how many polar bears are there? We've come up with an estimate of something like 26,000 polar bears worldwide. But that's a combination of uh, really good estimates for a few of the 19 subpopulations, poor estimates for some of the others, and wild ass guesses for the others. And so <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it, it isn't really a very solid number, and I'm really reluctant to talk about that. Gotcha. But we can talk about specific subpopulations uh, that we know what, what's going on. More, more funding for Polar Bears International. Yeah. For <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> for expeditions. Do we have another? Ah, please. Um, I'm curious. I know that there are major issues with, especially, I guess, in today's social media and political climate, but um, what do you see as the main sort of uh, uh, denial source or reason for denial between uh, people who are older and people who are younger. So, you know, th things, whether it's, you know, advocating in, in your own arguments for political figures, but I guess if, if you were to, um, I guess in your experience giving these talks, wh what, are, what do you think are, are the sources for denial for younger people and then the same for older people? I, ha I have searched my soul for why we haven't had action on uh, uh, dealing with global warming, and the only thing that I could come up to is greed. Uh, people who are making a lot of money from fossil fuels want to make more money. And uh, you can look around on the internet and uh, various articles in the New Yorker and places like that and read about how uh, very wealthy people are thinking that they can set themselves up despite the damage to the environment, that they can persist and their families can persist, and to heck with everybody else. And I really think that that has to be it, because I, I, I just can't imagine how people who are in policy positions would be willing to just say, oh, well, yeah, we need more, we need more oil and gas, and uh, even though it's destroying the world, we're going to get it. I just, I have a hard time with that. Now, there are a lot of younger people who don't seem to care. Uh, but fortunately, 
I think a majority of younger people really do see. And every year that we have, where we have a summer like this, or last summer, people are realizing, oh my God, something is going on. Um, I think a lot of younger people are just busy going through their lives and aren't really paying attention to global warming and other things and, and how that might impact their future. And that probably explains for the most part why there might be some denial or ignoring of, uh, of the issues among people like in your age group. Uh, but fortunately, uh, I think a majority of younger people really are on the ball on this and, and are realizing that their very futures are at stake. The older folks, it's got to be greed. I just, I just don't know of any other way to explain it. So with the understanding that we as individuals can have a relatively minor impact, <coughs> Uh, what, in your personal opinion, is the thing that we as individuals can do to reduce our carbon footprint the most? Well, I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're past the point where um, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. You know, the, the turning down your uh, thermostat and, and lowering your lights, of course you should do things like that. But the most important thing is to try and gather coalitions work within your communities, within your church, your synagogue, your social environments, uh, your, your friends. Don't be afraid to talk about it. Don't be afraid to learn a little bit so that you have some data that you can share with other people when the topic comes up. Uh, you know, I had uh, a conversation with a guy in a bar several years ago who uh, uh, he was asking me what I did and, uh, oh, and how are the polar bears doing? And I said, well, they're they're not doing very well, and they're going to continue to not do very well until uh, we get a handle on global warming. And he said, uh, oh, yeah, well, that's not going to happen. And I tried to engage him. I said, well, but it's up to us, isn't it? And, you know, he didn't want to go there, but some people will. And so to the extent that you can engage your friends and colleagues and put together these groups, there's a lot of really good work that's coming together in communities, in uh, uh, cities and towns that are actually making a difference. If you have every city in a state suddenly taking it seriously because, like in Florida, the governor of Florida couldn't care less about global warming, but a lot of those coastal cities are seeing impacts already, and they are trying to do something about it, and they can make a difference. They might have to drag the governor along kicking and screaming. I was hoping to, oh, there we go, bring up a, a slide uh, to connect to that a little bit in terms of work that the Climate Center is hoping to do. So we host an annual event on the, four, uh, the fourth annual Spokane Candidates Climate Change Forum is coming up next Wednesday. It's the first Wednesday of every October. And so the idea of the event is to create an opportunity for candidates who are running for local office to be uh, asked uh, about what they would do from the perspective of their office. So we invited candidates for Spokane County Commissioner and for the state legislature uh, to come and to uh, discuss, uh, you know, in a nonpartisan way from any political affiliation, what would you or what do you not support? Uh, and there's a lot that can be done at the local uh, county level and at the state level. And so uh, Ben Brown uh, and Laurel Burlingame, two uh, Gonzaga students, will be asking candidates questions. Uh, it's a really enjoyable event, and to keep it really civil, uh, because that's not always the case uh, in other venues, we don't allow booing or clapping. Instead, everybody gets a red or green card, and if you like what's being said, you hold up a green card, and if you don't like what's being said, you hold up a red card, and candidates get feedback right away about, uh, about it, but it's in a, in a respectful environment. So the idea is to, to create a situation where candidates are expected uh, to be able to talk about this issue in 2021, you know, at least 20 people in Spokane County died, 100 people statewide, 800 people in nor Northwest died during the heat dome. Uh, so candidates should have a view <laughs> about what they would do and what they would support uh, to, to address that. We also have uh, Dr. Laura Pettish, who's basically the second in command at the White House on climate adaptation, will be giving a talk on October 17th. Uh, she's um, at the White House's Office of Science and Technology 
Uh, and so that will be an excellent talk. So Dr. Sarah J. Raquette, who's the chair of the Environmental Studies Department at Humboldt State, we're talking about the living in a world that, that is in crisis and, and what the eco-anxiety aspects of that are uh, on November 1st. That will be virtual. And then Dr. John Abazoglu, uh, you talked a lot about climate models in your talk, and so he developed uh, a suite of, of climate visualization tools using different climate models and sort of averaging those models. And he's gonna be talking about whether we have any reason to believe climate models um, or whether climate models are just, just, not, just not trustworthy. And so we've had some interesting conversations amongst Gonzaga faculty about this. And so uh, he'll be doing a virtual talk as well. So anyway, it's interesting how they all kind of connect with uh, elements of your talk. So let's thank Dr. Amstrup one more time. Thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. We hope to see you at another event uh, really soon. Thank you so much.